Well, good afternoon, everybody, for the uh, the final session, final panel session of the day. My name's Warwick McKibben. I'm um, director of the Centre for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis here at the ANU, and I'm a chief investigator and head of the ANU node of CPAR, um, and which is uh, a great privilege to be in both. Uh, today, panel, we have four excellent speakers. Um, the plan is to introduce a speaker, have them make comments for up to 10 minutes, return to their seat, and then at the end of everyone's comments, I'll bring the panel out to the panel list table, and people uh, can then ask Q&A until uh, the final session when Mark DeCuil will make a few closing remarks. Um, the first speaker today, no one in this room really needs uh, an introduction about Ian, but Ian Yates is Chief Executive of the Council of Ageing, that's COTA Australia, and it's a national peak consumer body for older Australians. He's also chair of the newly established Ageing and Aged Care Council of Elders and a member of the National Aged Care Advisory Council and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Advisory Council. He's had a very long, distinguished career helping older Australians and it's a great pleasure to have Ian to make a few remarks. I should mention the session is called Challenges and Responses for Implementation. The idea is to take everything we've heard today and to bring it to the point of what do we do, how do we do it. I don't expect we'll have all the answers, but I think it'll be a good way to continue the discussion. So over to you, Ian. Thanks, Warwick. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and it's uh, um, I might yeah, it's been a very interesting day from my point of view, um, as well as uh, the areas that of code is well known for in aged care. We have been quite active the last. I don't know, decade, but particularly the last five or six years in the retirement income space. We uh, convene a thing called the Consumer Focused Retirement Income Roundtable, um, in which some people uh, here have been involved and CPA is involved, um, and been active in terms of some of a significant number of the reforms that government has made to the degree that those reforms have yet been made. Some of them are still very much works in progress. But um, I, I think it has been a pretty rich day. There are a few things I, I would like to emphasize, I think. Um, we talked early in the day about, about impairment of decision making. Um, and I thought, I thought that was an interesting discussion in that it's still, I mean, clearly there are people who have impaired um, capacity late in life. Although I would note that just because you have a diagnosis of dementia does not mean that you have no capacity. It is but then about limitations on that and effects on that capacity, which do actually vary quite a lot from individual to individual. And the notion that is now being talked about a great deal is supported decision making. Because the experience of most people with dementia is that once they have that diagnosis, everybody talks about them as if they weren't there, whereas mostly they are there until quite late. Um, and frequently the issues are not that the person doesn't know what they want, but communication of that and actually being taken seriously. In terms of the broader issue of older people and decision making about financial matters, I think Contextually, we also need to bear in mind that a lot of what we've been talking about is a period of life when actually, and increasingly, this is going to be the case, people have, have or are approaching access to a level of funds that they've never had as spare funds before. And with superannuation balances growing, uh, that's going to be increasingly the case. What people have mostly spent their adult lives doing is paying down debt, paying down mortgages, paying off credit cards, uh, et, et cetera, um, and then trying to save. And we have a much more efficient accumulation system now than we ever did, but that's what they've been doing. The whole notion of deaccumulation, of spending in your retirement, is actually culturally foreign to us. And it's been culturally foreign, frankly, to many of the super funds for years. I mean, I remember Jeremy Cooper talking to me, Jeremy Cooper did the Cooper Review, talking to me about 
many people he knows in funds who he said just have no, I mean, if you say it rationally to them, of course it's obvious, but in fact, have no sense that their members are going to spend that money. They're just, even the advertising, say industry supers advertising, it doesn't talk about what kind of income you're going to have. It talks about how big a nest egg you're going to have. And the funds themselves talk about how big they are compared to each other. There just has not been that focus in the dialogue with, with most. There are some exceptions, but with most people. And then we are saying in the system that we have that people who have never had that kind of um, need to invest, and there are, there are people who do, but the people who haven't, suddenly need to make a decision about what they're going to do about this big lump of money that they've never had before. And then as others have pointed out, that happens in a, in, a, in a regulatory and policy environment where there are different messages coming and as Michael Lai admitted, although there's attempts in government to coordinate and make consistent, they're not successful. So you've got different messages coming out in different languages from social services, from, from health and aged care, from your super fund, from the pension system and so on. So I think we need to be conscious of that and we need to think about how we actually can both individually and systemically strengthen agency uh, and um, en enable people to grasp that situation much earlier in life than they are often left to do it. I might also say that I think that one of the reasons that many older Australians are the subjects, are particular subjects of scams, is the same. They actually are in possession of a large amount of information. A lot of scams target people who are probably going to have retirement income that they can apply to the scam. And some of the scams are quite explicitly about that. Um, <clears throat> the second theme I think is really important that a number of you uh, emphasised, and I was, I was really heartened to see the emphasis, is co-design or what people call design by testing. Um, it isn't de rigor government policy, although I'm pleased to say that in the current aged care reform process, we are seeing a much greater effort by the Department of Health and Aged Care to do co-design than we've ever seen before. And even the creation of the Council of Elders as the Royal Commission recommendation was a, a pointer in that direction. We are only a group of 14 people, but we not work with the department not only on what their policy options, uh, what they should be looking at in their policy options and what the pluses and minuses of them are, but also on how they reach out to quite wide and diverse networks of older, older people. That needs to be applied in this arena in financial decision making work as well. What do people want? What do, and I, you know, I, I frequently am quoting Hazel Bateman <laughs> in my set world because the kind of things that Hazel talked about are fundamental. Test what the message actually means to the person. You know, I don't find it any surprise, for example, in Hazel's example, that the pie chart was what people identified with. Because all those words, what do they mean to the average person? But I know what a pie chart is. What it means to me is probably, as Hazel said, quite different to what the fund thought it was telling you. So you've actually got to test that stuff. How do you write a message that makes sense to the person rather than makes sense to you as a fund, to the regulator, etc.? And that's got to be thought through and it's got to be thought through in the regulatory environment as well. Because you're not actually achieving the purpose of providing information or advice if it is not interpreted as the way you intended it by its recipient. There actually isn't a communication. There actually, I think as Hazel demonstrated, miscommunication. And that's really fundamental. And then I think it is true too that um, we have tended to place, and the system places enormous responsibility on the individual, as I said, suddenly to be good financial investors decision makers about things that they actually don't know much about at all. Is it any wonder that some of them react to events like 
super, uh, stock market crashes and other things in the way that they do. And frequently, the person who, the, the, where they're getting their information from is from a peer. And that peer isn't informed. We know that. We know that a large amount of information that people know about their aged care is from peers and, and families, none of whom are all that informed. So a lot of, of work has gone in the aged care system into creating an entry point, into creating, and we're about to have this, uh, guiders, advisors who help people through the system in simplifying the system, but we're a long way away from it. Uh, particularly in terms of the financial implications, although we're currently working uh, with some advisors on a digital tool for older, older people about aged care costs. The problem with that as a product is it will describe a chaotic situation because government policy about your, your investment in your aged care is inconsistent uh, and needs, as Michael Lai said, needs to be much more robust and clear. So I think there's we need to think about the policy settings clearer. We've been a really strong supporter of the Retirement Income Covenant. I'd have to say we think the jury's out on the responses, many of the responses to that as yet. Um, and the industry needs to think that through in terms of whether or not it's going to end up with a push for greater regulation rather than working out how to do that really well itself. Um, because, you know, really significant impacts in terms of people's levels of retirement quality of life depend on how well funds get that right. And that's something that, that certainly the consumer movement we're looking at really closely in the, near, in the coming years. Perhaps I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Ian. There are a number of important points that Ian just made, which I'm sure we can discuss further uh, in the panel. Uh, the second speaker is Mark Oliver, who's the Chief Distribution Officer at Insignia Finance and the Group Executive responsible for product sales and relationship management functions across platforms, investments and private trustee services. Mark joined Insignia in 2016 from Blackrock, Blackrock where he was Managing Director, Head of Wholesale Sh Advisory and iShares. Over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, Warren. And uh, we're conscious I'm the one standing between uh, now and drinks or now and your taxi. So uh, I'll keep my comments brief, but firstly, perhaps an introduction for those of you who have not heard of Insignia Financial. Uh, we we uh, were formerly known as the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. Insignia certainly has a nicer ring to it. Um, we've also been quite acquisitive over the years, having acquired the ANZ wealth business and latterly MLC which currently today makes us one of the largest providers of superannuation in the country, also one of the largest payer of pensions in the country. Um, and uh, through that process, we're also the largest financial advice uh, licensor in the country. So I think between all of those things, we have some fairly unique perspectives on uh, the topic at hand today. Um, and I think guided by uh, our very simple purpose, which is understand me, look after me, secure my future, so very deliberately sit it, positioned in the first person, focused on the individual client or member. Our marketing people hate that, by the way, because it doesn't roll off very nicely as understand me, look after me, secure my future. But it reminds us every day that the decisions that we make, the products and services we provide, are aiming to change the lives of an individual. Now, many of the topics covered today um, uh, really resonate at the crosshairs of our integrated business. Um, particularly in the increasingly complex environment, so you can tick that one off, uh, the value of financial advice. And I will reference to the work that we did um, in the, uh, if you like, the true value of advice as it's been seen by those who have employed the services of a comprehensive financial advisor and those who have not. Um, and also the importance and the emergence of increasing numbers of vulnerable clients as we see the aging process move through, the importance of estate planning and uh, the impact it can have on the quality of retired life. And finally, the role of housing and in retirement funding. So very briefly, our true value of advice was a piece of research that we worked on with Core Data back in 2020. 
um, which really uh, undertook say, the largest survey of its nature in the local context, if not the global context. So it was about 13,000 uh, respondents. Uh, about 1,500 of those were unadvised. The remainder had had a relationship with a financial advisor. And it looked to the relationships and the attitudes towards financial advisors, the preferences and the barriers within the advice process, and the needs and wants that, that clients expect from financial advice. I also looked at both financial benefits and non-financial benefits. Now, there is a piece of work which is available if, if you would like to access it, but it brings through what we call the advice dividend, which is essentially um, quantifying the difference between those who have experienced advice and those who have not. In almost all demographics, whether it's by age, by geography, by gender, by account balance, those who have involved in a financial advice relationship place the value of that relationship above the price of the advice that they paid. They also express the value of that advice in terms that were quite apart from a financial sum. So the non-financial factors around the ability to sleep at night, the ability to have comfort in knowing that yours and your loved one's affairs were taken care of, start to point out after we've heard comments today around the impact that the Royal Commission and a 20 or 30 year old system that was born out of life insurance sales now is actually has had a significant amount of change to its proposition and there is real value in the engagement of a financial advisor. Now, if I also come back to the idea that our purpose is around the individual, the opportunity here is actually, I think, a strong humanizing opportunity to be done at scale. And if we look at the interactions we have with our superannuation fund members, with our financial advice clients, it's the human contact that actually creates some of the greatest value. And the challenge for providers is how do you scale that human contact? How do you take human-centered design, take it to a point where you can work more closely on an individual basis around the client need? And as our speakers have spoken about already today, in that drawdown phase, there are much less homogenous needs in retirement. And I think that lends itself much more greatly to a humanizing conversation. And so the role of the individual, the human contact and relationship, early and pre-retirement and pre-loss of, of capability is crucial, we think, to building trusted relationships either within a family or with service providers. Uh, we also um, see the advent through our advice interactions. Uh, and I think we've talked about it today, uh, this, this idea of, if you like, the, the, the club sandwich generation. So there's the... Uh, the sort of 55 year old who has an aging parent and also has children that they support. We're now seeing this emergence as that same generation are starting to look after the grandchildren as well as their parents. So you have this club sandwich generation starting to emerge where oftentimes decisions on behalf of aged parents are left with that generation because no arrangements have been put in place before they've lost the capacity either to consider uh, going into uh, aged care or other areas. So the emergence of that uh, area puts a tremendous amount of stress on that, if you like, that, that emerging generation. Um, we think that the uh, role of advice in preparing uh, all of those cohorts for the decisions that they will need to make in future is, is crucial. Um, turning to the area of retirement funding, I think there is still a disconnect. So we certainly are, uh, we, we've covered well today this idea of basic questions about have I got enough and how long will it last? Um, these longevity questions do play out in quite different ways. And again, we've, we've heard reference today and we see it in our own data of our own super fund. A very large portion of pension phase clients who only draw down the minimum amount. Uh, and it comes back to some of the research that we've seen, but there's also there's still a continuing attitude about things like the desire to leave an inheritance when people's needs in longer life are, are quite different to where they were in their earlier generations. Um, the role that housing can play in retirement uh, also has an important pathway, I think, uh, where policy can, can help. Um, we found that retirees that have a house that they own are generally better off, it would sound obvious, than those that don't. However, it doesn't necessarily translate into an increased quality of life for those who are homeowners. 
Again, some of those reasons are the same as before. They tend not to draw down on the retirement income sources that they have. Uh, and also, um, there is that desire to hold the house even when they've outgrown the need for it. However, we do see encouraging uh, policy changes around downsizer allowance. Uh, I think the area of um, reverse mortgages, I think the, the terminology has some scar tissue uh, that remain from when banks were in this space and, and seeing it as an opportunity uh, to, to, to make margin. Actually, I think there are some good innovations in that space where, again, I think policy can help uh, provide access to the value of a house while you're still living in it. Um, interestingly, from a policy perspective, oftentimes a financial advisor um, will only be able to advise on traditional financial products. A very small proportion of financial advisors are also qualified to talk about lending. Uh, so most AFSL holders do not hold an Australian credit license. So in having that conversation about equity release or reverse mortgages, there are some challenges in, in opening up that conversation too. I think these policy hand, uh, changes go hand in hand to make better uh, uh, access and affordability of advice. Um, and I, we applaud the quality of advice review, which is currently underway. I think it's definitely heading in the right direction. And uh, anything that helps us find new avenues to improve aging client outcomes, the better. In terms of responses, briefly to um, the, the earlier comments, I think uh, certainly with my introduction, design by testing, absolutely. I think uh, as super funds consolidate, they will be forced to be building better products that respond to their specific client needs. Um, whilst the regulator is increasingly pushing funds to think about their members in a cohort sense, uh, we would much rather think around the cohort of one. So building outcomes and, and designing around specific client needs rather than mandated age bands or wealth bands. Uh, from a trusts and biases perspective, uh, as I highlighted earlier, I think uh, trust has a rebuild phase required in advice. Uh, notwithstanding, we can point to the value of advice. Um, one interesting data point, uh, one of our major advice licensees um, sources its advice clients by referral from credit unions. It gets about 20,000 referrals a year from credit unions. Less than 40% of those go through to a final advice relationship. So there's a huge amount of waste, if you like, of people referring, deciding not to take up advice. One of the reasons they don't take up advice is because we lead with the price. And if you tell somebody something's gonna cost three and a half thousand dollars and they don't understand what that thing is, you shouldn't be surprised that they repel against it. What we found is we went to a cohort of those members who had declined the advice offer and gave them 60 minutes of free advice. Now the aim was to understand. It was not to convert, it was to understand what mattered to them and how we could improve the advice process and the advice outcomes for them. One interesting byproduct is having invested 60 minutes of a human to human contact which was not product related. It was entirely empathy and listening and responding to questions driven by the client. We found that 25 to 30% of those clients then asked to see a full service financial advisor. So I think that opportunity to build trust is a wide open opportunity for our industry. The challenge is of course, scaling it. Um, and, and finally for me, um, we have enough products in our industry. In fact, we've got too many products. I applaud the Retirement Income Covenant. And I think the way it's setting out is actually allowing trustees to build a comprehensive strategy over time. My concern would be if trustees start to quickly release products because we've got enough already. What I think we lack is frameworks and conversations that help put those products into context, married against individuals, needs, wants, and goals. That was it from me. I look forward to the panel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Again, an, another another set of you know, very rich comments, and I think the interplay of all the presenters is going to be very interesting in a few minutes. The next speaker uh, is Lynn Kelly, who is the first Assistant Secretary for the Retirement Advice and Investment Division at Treasury, uh, who are responsible for providing policy and legislative advice to government on initiatives to improve Australia's financial security and raise retirement standards. Lynn also has extensive experience in the private sector.
So over to you, Lynn. I should mention to everyone too, online as well, there's a much more detailed biography uh, in the, um, out the program for the conference, so please feel free to, to look at that as well. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, so the comments that Michael made earlier about the challenges of having policy responsibility for aged care, I mirror them today in relation to the policy responsibility I have around the superannuation system, financial advice and managed investments. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the role of CEPA and CALMA. To provide policy and solutions, we actually need sound evidence. Um, through research, we can better understand the drivers and impacts, including on specific cohorts. As we've heard today, the factors contributing to decision-making in retirement are complex, with some features and challenges universal and some unique to specific cohorts. I briefly highlight a couple of findings from the Retirement Income Review in 2020. It found that the retirement income system is effective, sound, and its costs are broadly sustainable. However, it noted the system is very complex. There is a need to improve understanding of the system. There is complexity, there are misconceptions, there is low financial literacy, and that has resulted in people not adequately planning for their retirement or making the most of their assets in retirement. And that's a key question that I think about from a policy perspective. How do we support people using the money that they put away for retirement actually in their retirement? You save money to buy a house, you use that money to buy the house. You don't use the interest on your deposit, on your savings for the deposit, you use the savings. What makes retirement savings so different? Why is there such a strong public perception across all ages that only the earnings on retirement savings are to be consumed and their capital to be preserved? I was asked in the break why I care about that. The reason I care about it is the reality is that there are so many older Australians who are living more frugally than they need to. And they're not enjoying the quality of life that they should otherwise be enjoying in retirement. The Retirement Income Review, as well as a body of other research, has noted the reasons for this. So there's the nest egg versus financial income framing, longevity risk. People are genuinely concerned about outliving their retirement, outliving their superannuation. We've heard this morning about the fear of end of life costs, particularly aged care, impacting the consumption of retirement savings. And also the sheer complexity. Navigating the system and all the interactions between the transfer system and the tax system is hard. We've talked about the accessibility and affordability of quality financial advice and misconceptions around the role of minimum drawdown rates. There's also concerns about what will happen to the age pension. Clearly one policy intervention is not going to solve all of that. Um, so I'll touch a few on a few of these issues and some of the things that I'm thinking about in terms of policy settings. So across the day we've talked about financial capability and there's a broad recognition that people in or near retirement are an important cohort to target for financial capability because transitioning into retirement and living in retirement comes with unique financial decisions and during working life many people won't have actually got that financial capability to manage those decisions. According to a survey of recent retirement, a survey of retirement intentions by the ABS in 2020, there were, were almost a million people over 45 that did not have a plan to retire. So we think about how to build that capability across a lifetime, but we've also talked today about nudging at, at critical milestones in life. But we also think about making sure that we're supporting financial capability with ensuring that products are offered in a more targeted manner to retirees who they're actually suitable for. The recent design and distribution obligations, for example, that started in October 2021, are an example of a more consumer-centric approach in regulation and law. We've talked about how the superannuation guarantee turns 30 this year. Um, and as part of that maturing, we need to mature from accumulation focus to a pretty underdeveloped retirement phase in Australia. I was surprised by the comments around um, the US versus Australia because I think our system, retirement system, is pretty under, underdeveloped. Um, we talked about the retirement income covenant coming in on the 1st of July this year and the key objectives being maximising retirement income, managing risk and some flexible savings, flexible access to savings. Um, it's fair to say that the first strategies have been mixed um, but it is intended over time that these strategies will continue to develop, they'll be iterative, and they will provide members with better outcomes. 
and options for better decision making in retirement. Retirement is complex. It's been described as requiring retirees to solve a risky, long horizon, multi-dimensional pro problem. Hence the reliance on defaults and rules of thumb by some, which does actually lead to suboptimal decisions for some people. The Retirement Income Review noted that retirees are strongly influenced by the statutory minimum drawdown rates. More than half of retirees older than 65 draw down at the minimum rate, and the median withdrawal is not much more than that. But a minimum drawdown strategy will not exhaust balances of a typical retiree. Under a scenario of 6.5% net earnings on balances, a person who retires at the age of 65 will have around 40% of their balance remaining at life expectancy of 90 in real dollars. When minimum drawdown rates were reduced recently, we saw pension incomes fall as well. It's important to note that that actually does not necessarily reflect a decision by retirees. Some of these reductions are actually automatically applied by funds and some members do not understand that they could actually maintain their income level if they preferred. They think the drawdown rate is mandatory. CEPA's research has acknowledged that default settings may be a good alternative to address poor decision making, provided the default is well designed. And from a policy perspective, that's a key issue, well designed. Um, and note there's a spectrum. There's nudges, there's soft defaults, and then there's statutory requirements. Some can provide safeguards, the guardrails, while balancing an individual's ability to choose based on their own personal circumstances, because retirees are not a homogenized cohort. I'd like to finish just with a few comments on financial advice. Lower financial literacy is correlated with a range of factors that reduce retirement income, such as lower superannuation balances, paying higher fees, and are less likely to have a retirement plan. Yet most people do not seek financial advice at retirement. Only 26% of 55 to 60 year olds seek financial advice at retirement. And there are many reasons for this. Professionalization of the financial advice industry is one aspect to addressing this. The complexity in the financial decision making highlights the importance of having professional standards for financial advisors that actually include a focus on ethics. Commissioner Hayne noted in the financial report on the Royal Commission, sorry, the final report, the Royal Commission to the misconduct in the banking, superannuation and financial services industry, that prevention of poor advice begins with education and training. He noted that making financial advice a profession is important not merely for its own sake, it's a necessary step to protect those who seek financial advice. We've talked about the quality advice review and also the importance of increasing access and affordability of advice. It is important to acknowledge though, that not every consumer will have an ongoing relationship with an advisor, nor is every consumer likely to need this in life or in retirement. And that's why it's important to have a mix of guidance, advice and defaults to support us with financial decisions. And as much as possible, it's important to make clear when each option may be suitable. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lynn. Um, the next final presenter is Susan Thorpe, who's an old friend of mine from a long time ago. Um, Susan is Professor of Finance and Associate Dean Research at the University of Sydney Business School. She researches consumer finance, focusing on retirement savings. She's published in some of the world's leading economics journals, and she is brilliant at raising funds for external sources for research. So over to you, Susan. I just, before I start, I think it would be appropriate to end the day with a little um, cameo piece of research that um, goes, uh, goes to most of the things that we've talked about over the course of the day. Uh, it goes to the context um, in which we consider um, decisions about retirement. It goes to the question of how we might or might not encourage people to draw down their, uh, their superannuation during retirement. It goes to user testing. Um, it, it looks at uh, potential reasons and preferences around um, why or why not people may spend. So I think I'll just very briefly 
um, give a, a little concrete example, if you like, of some research that I think um, is a step in the direction of answering some of the many, many important questions that we've addressed today. But before we talk about that, I just want to make a couple of remarks about financial advice, since that's been um, very eloquently addressed by the three um, panel members who've come before me and also has come up in several of the sessions that we've had um, uh, earlier today. One of the, um, what, when we talk about financial advice in Australia, and to some extent this was true of the, um, uh, the way that Suzanne framed it as well for the US, we, we think about financial advice as providing a, a service which is compensated. We usually think of it in terms of um, providing a service to people who have the resources to pay for it. Um, if we think about financial advice as addressing a need, the need for advice, we would probably reverse that. So the times in our, over the course of the life cycle when we most need financial advice are usually the times when we have the least resources to pay for it. So my partner loses their job, my mortgage is underwater, um, someone important to me passes away, I become disabled. These are, these are significant events that really have very large impacts on our lifetime welfare, at which time we are least able to purchase the service of financial advice. So um, I know that we're constrained by the way that financial advice is um, defined by regulation in Australia, and we have a way of thinking about it which is very related to the framing that we've, we've all been using around providing a service to people who are able to pay for it. But I think it would also be helpful in our thinking about advice to think of it in terms of the need of the person receiving advice rather than necessarily a person who has capacity to pay. So um, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's, there are necessary and sufficient conditions, if you like, for obtaining advice, and we often think about this, in, I think, in the reverse way. So let's um, let's now turn to the um, to the question of um, uh, some work that's been done recently by one of our research teams, and I'd like to highlight the fact that this research has been led by Ben Newell, who we heard from earlier today, and um, one of Ben's students, Rochelle Nain, who was uh, an honours student in psychology at the University of New South Wales, and we had the um, privilege of working with Rochelle. She's an unusual person in that she studied both psychology and actuarial studies, um, and is now working in industry, but we hope to lure her back into more research in future. So um, this, this research um, goes to the question of how you might encourage someone to spend their superannuation. And I'm sure that when the superannuation guarantee was put in place in the early 1990s, people didn't really think this was going to be a problem. They actually probably anticipated the reverse problem, which is that the age pension means testing will encourage everybody to spend their superannuations too fast and we will still have a large proportion of people dependent on the age pension. But as Lynn pointed out as the retirement income review has shown and, in, and as much research since, what we actually see is that people are reluctant to spend their capital and that, that can be for many reasons, not necessarily at all related to biases. Can we have the next slide please? So um, our approach to addressing this problem was to provide some simple information. So as we've noted and, and William Sharp has reinforced to us, this is a very hard problem. If we set a couple of supercomputers humming, they could spend several weeks on trying to solve this optimal, um, optimal control problem. So we were interested in a slightly less technical um, outcome, a uh, slightly less technical solution to this problem. And we were uh, motivated by some work that we'd done earlier that, um, that Hazel mentioned on trying to understand the way that projections can appear to be able to encourage people to change their accumulation patterns. And so we were interested in whether part of the problem with retirement um, spending might be the same problem as um, savings in reverse, that this compounding issue is very hard. So um, a compounding problem is an amortisation problem in reverse. And so since decumulation is an amortisation problem, we thought the same technology might work in that situation. So we imagined um, taking the same projection set up and giving it to people who were of the appropriate age and asking them what they would do um, under these circumstances in terms of spending. Um, so the hypothesis that we began with was projections would prompt people to increase their withdrawal amount and draw down their superannuation faster. 
So we, uh, we undertook a very simple um, experiment that Rochelle um, designed with Ben's advice. Um, and this is basically all the information that we gave people. And we had groups of people to whom we gave subsets of this information. But for the purposes of, the, of what's in the experiment, here's the full sample. You can see that we did actually offer people the minimum level of withdrawal, which was equivalent to the default level in an account-based pension. Um, we gave them a reasonable balance to spend. We told them what they might have left at age 92 if they spent like this. And we told them, um, in, in some cases, we also told them what their income would be per, per year. And we advised them that the age pension was there as a safety net in the background. So it's a very simple advice, quite close to what people, um, quite close to a slightly developed um, uh, presentation of an account-based pension, no risk no issues about return, no fees, nothing really to complicate the picture. So what did people do? Well, interestingly, they didn't do the minimum, which is actually what we see a lot of in the data. And the minimum here is that grey dash line that you can see on the bottom of the graph. So vertical axis is the average withdrawal that people in the experiment chose over a series of spaced out choices that reflected moving from basically early retirement to um, to age, uh, to, well, to age 92. That's right, isn't it, Ben, age 92? And then, and then the lines at the top show what people chose when we gave them subsets of that information that you saw on the earlier slide. And you can see, if you look carefully at the blue line that starts at the top and then um, moves to the bottom of the graph, that the steepest spending rate, so the, the, most, um, the highest average withdrawal amount, was um, actually associated with showing people an income projection. So um, that, that, was, that, was, that was sort of what we were expecting. We sort of thought that if we showed people an income projection, that that might encourage them to withdraw their superannuation a bit faster because we were solving the amortisation problem for them. Now, the other interesting thing to note on this graph that turns out to be more important than the income versus wealth issue is where the, all those lines start. So if you look at the very t starting point of that graph, all those lines start at about $25,000, which is very close to which piece of information on the previous slide? The age pension. Okay, so we stared at this for a while and we thought, I don't think we've got the whole story here. There's part of the story here, but there's more going on. And why is everybody thinking about $25,000 in the first choice set? So, um, if could we go through? Yep, next one. So, this is the same, basically the same information in a different graph, but just emphasises the fact that the income projection um, was the most effective piece of information at um, getting people to draw down. So it did lead to a faster rate of um, decrease in people's superannuation balance. And clearly, the, the, when given this extra information, people were not wedded to the minimum drawdown rate. Other things were guiding their choices. Okay, so these, you know, basically projections in the income stream format did encourage participants to draw down, but importantly, reminding them about the age pension seemed to be important as well. So then we went on to the next stage, which was to think about um, using a different income reference. So I'm not going to show you all the background in the interest of time, but in this, in this round of experiments, we were more interested in how important this income reference might have been to helping people choose. So in, in, these, in the conditions in this experiment, um, we gave people in some conditions information about the age pension. We also gave them information about the ASFA comfortable drawdown standard for an individual. And then in other, in, in, other, um, in other conditions, they just saw the um, income projection instead. So we've got combinations here on the graph of different reference points for income and, and projections, um, income projections um, or, or not income projections. Now, this graph told us something different. It actually showed us that the most important piece of information that we gave people in this instance was the ASFA standard. So people's decisions in this experiment were strongly influenced by that ASPA reference point um, and that, that was the um, lever that was tilting behaviour the most out of all the bits of information that we gave people. So just going on to the next slide. So we found that the ASPA standard was really important. People responded to this particular income targets and, um, and people who had higher financial literacy and numeracy drew down faster. 
So this is, this is an example, I think, of a few things. One is that the information that you give people, they may use in ways that you're not exactly expecting. So first of all, we expected to see people would stick to the minimum drawdown rule because that's what we see in practice and we did not. Secondly, we didn't think that the, um, that the income anchors would be as influential as they are in the experiment. And we've still got more work to do in understanding how, how projections are going to matter um, uh, in, in this context. So the other, the other, I think the other takeaway from this is not only is it important to test what it is that you're giving to people, I think the, another takeaway is that what you give people will influence their choices particularly in situations where the background is confusing, there are, a lot of, um, there are a lot of competing influence, there's a lot of information, there are many, many complex regulatory structures at play and, and as Ian pointed out, people are confronted with a problem that is very unfamiliar. Um, most of us have not had to manage, you know, $300,000 of cash prior other than to pay down a debt, you know, uh, that we already owe. So, um, so I think one, apart from the fact that we see that, um, that, you know, the testing matters, the other thing I think we see is that in these situations where people are confused, they will use whatever information we give them as long as they can understand it. Um, so that makes a selection of information and the targets that we give to people very, very important. As Lynn pointed out, well-designed policy is, is the critical thing here and testing can help us understand how people are going to respond to that information. Thanks very, very much, Susan. That was fascinating. Um, the line score crossed at a common point in one of those slides. Is that accidental or is that a normalisation? Okay, we have no questions here. Let, let me um, raise a few issues. Uh, unless anyone on the panel would like to make a comment on a panellist presentation, I might start there. That might be a good place to start. I echo Susan's comments around the definition of advice. I think you're absolutely right. I think everybody perceives it to be full service comprehensive advice. I think our interpretation would be it's any tip, tool or uh, support that we can give a member to make a better decision. Yes. Just have a question to Susan on the findings. If I'm being critical, I'm a little bit confused about the fact that if you only show the income and that facilitate higher drawdown from the members, from the participants of the experiment, but you have another line where you show both the income and the wells together, it, it goes back and then... Spend that long explaining exactly how the experiments work. So in the first round of experiments, there were different um, conditions. In, some people didn't see either um, what would happen to their superannuation balance, their wealth, or their income. Some people just saw their wealth, some people just saw a projected income outcome, and some people saw both wealth and income. So the slide I showed you was the fourth of those, the last condition that had all the information. But many people in the... We wanted to test those differences between those people, so not everybody saw all of that information, and some of them didn't see any of it. I find it hard to only show the income projection without showing the implications to the balance if you want to imp We had income and the different anchors because if we um, expand the possibilities of the different anchors plus the different projection outcomes, that's too many conditions. So we, we stuck to just the income stream projection, both as a verification of what we've done previously and because we were actually interested in how the anchors move people around. Yeah. Finding that all the lines start much higher than the minimum is very interesting. That would be a model rather because if you check the you know, over form of superintendent funds, they don't they don't call it minimum, they just call it default or you don't have to take anything. Oh, yeah. Maybe you're different because you call it minimum explicitly and that word yeah. has some implications. And, and different funds are different, but um, uh, Hazel has said that some funds only show like the only the choice is minimum or choose something else, but or choose something else doesn't have any shape, if you know what I mean, or any target associated with it. So, so if you if you're left with either I choose the minimum or there's an infinite possible <coughs> number of drawdowns above that, then um, most people don't know where to pick. No. Yeah. Yeah. Can I just ask a question following on from the question? Uh, I don't do experimental design, but 
What happens if you repeated this game to the participants? Do they change their behaviour? Um, Ben's probably the best person to answer that. We, we didn't actually repeat it, but um, Ben's probably in the best but, position to answer um, that. And they have 10 choices through them. So within one experimental session, they have 10 choices and they see the impact on their balance of their income projections that go through. Um, we haven't then given them exactly the same task to do the second time around. I'm thinking more of sharing the information about what everyone, what everyone else is doing. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Is, there a, is there an effect where yeah. you know, what everyone else is doing? Like a zero the plus yeah, right. Right. Yeah. 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 effect, which I think um, is an important uh, informa bit of information that Ian pointed out about where people get their information from. Yeah, right. you, could, you could imagine having a condition where you say 5% of people given this choice do the next. So this rather than the other one. I wouldn't recommend using that as a no. product tool. <laughs> <laughs> Those that have gone before us have fallen foul of uh, what other people like you do. <laughs> yes. On that same line of questions, uh, what do we know about um, the relationship between drawdown and spending and consumption? Like, to what extent might people choose a certain drawdown strategy but actually end up saving in their own bank accounts outside of super. Yeah. Um, I'm probably not the best person in the room to answer that question. I have read some research on that, but I can't remember the answer to the question, right? Yeah. So yeah. It's just interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe a research question. Just some, some. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, There's some evidence from the early release Data, right? Of people taking money out of their super as a result of the COVID early release scheme, that they didn't spend it straight away, they put it in the bank. Mm. So, yeah. to, uh, even though it wasn't necessarily. Yeah. The and, and there are probably all sorts of other tax related reasons yeah. for this, but the, and Lynn probably knows more than I do, but the, the fact that we hear people um, ask for a reduction in the withdrawal rate when there has been a downturn, as happened in COVID, probably suggests that people think of spending it, or at least when it comes out, it's gone. That's my feeling. Uh -huh. But maybe they're just wanting to protect the tax, the tax-preserved environment, uh -huh. the account-based pension. I think also in when there's major market volatility, it's also this consciousness of not forcing people to sell down, divest assets, the lower of the market. Yeah. Um, and so that's also another reason to adjust minimum drawdown rates when there's yeah. big, you know, we saw it during the GFC and we saw it during mm. COVID as well. Mm. I think from some of the analysis we've done, and granted, we, when we look at our administration platforms, you may get skewed towards wealthier advised clients in some respects, but uh, you have to keep in mind that superannuation doesn't tell you all the answers because many of those will have non-super investments. Mm -hmm. Even if you look at the profile of drawdown of pension, um, you actually have to look at that over a long period of time because there may come points where there's a significant drawdown because they pay the grandchildren's school fees or they pay for an operation. So, you know, the drawdown doesn't tell you all the story. There'll be spikes along that journey. And that's also important to acknowledge, you know, there are three pillars to the retirement yeah. income system and voluntary savings is one, yeah. and so. Mm. So again, it might be entirely logical, that pattern. You know, that, mm. How much would be a lack of trust in institutions surviving a major economic shock? Like people sold down their shares in Qantas, for example, because they didn't think Qantas would survive. What about, do they have complete trust? Just come back to the issue of trust. Do they have complete trust in the financial institutions that are looking after the funds that they have in their super? Because that was a very extreme shock. That was a one in a hundred year shock. Mm -hmm. I just wonder whether that issue of trust also fills across into the institutional trust issue and whether there's a set of issues there that we haven't really worried about from a regulatory point of view. And trust sometimes comes up as a reason for not spending uh, because you don't trust that the safety men are gonna be there. And that's, that was one of the findings of the retirement income review. The age pension is a main safety net and there were concerns around 
what would happen to the age pension, mm -hmm. which, I mean, I guess if you think about when the superannuation guarantee, whilst its genesis was a bit early when it actually came in, we were in a period where we were looking at the sustainability of the age pension and low national savings. So that's probably why some of that concern around safety nets exists. Well, in 2014, uh, the other government wanted to index prices. Uh, so very, very recent uh, potential policy proposal to index the pension and make it work much less. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's great. So we do have a question online, which I'll relay. Um, interesting how retirees are encouraged to spend their retirement savings, with a lot of the research focused on those receiving the age pension, in brackets, where the age pension acts as a proxy to manage longevity risk, close bracket. How do you apply this idea to those who have sought uh, SMSF self-managed superannuation wealth, or is it impossible to legislate for them to spend their, their wealth in their lifetime? <laughs> self-managed self super funds still do have to draw down. They still have to spend yeah. in retirement. Um, yeah. It's just they exist in a different kind of fund, um, but they still have to use their savings in, re in retirement and you know we have had a number of policy interventions um, over the years around limiting the amounts of people can put into superannuation to ensure that it's used for retirement income um, so around both what you can put in on an annual basis but the amount that you can have in the pension phase so there has been a number of policy interventions and self-managed super funds are still subject to the same rules as APRA regulated funds around that. I did have a question actually. Design by testing is a common theme throughout the day. And I wanted to just clarify, I mean, I think design by testing might mean different things for policy versus institutions designing products. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wonder whether there's, there's a case here for greater coordination between the research community, the, um, the regulators, the government policies, and the financial community uh, in terms of doing the testing cooperatively in some way, instead of having compartmentalizing the analyses that are being done, because it seems like it's interrelated across the different groups. Is that, do you see that will be emerging more? I mean, there's a reason for this conference is to bring people together to talk about these issues. But it seems like if that is one of the key themes, this sort of interdependence between policy design, product design, and academic research is pretty critical. Does anyone like to comment further on that? Oh, um, I agree. Um, so, for instance, we've got the review of the Your Future, Your Super happening at the moment. And as part of that, we've got a, a number of stakeholder um, roundtables that are happening at the moment. But we also have a technical working group that comprises industry, it comprises academia, it comprises consumer um, groups. Um, and it's meant to be representative. But we're also doing things where, um, so the behavioural economics team um, for Australian government have been, have recently looked at the Your, your Super tool. Um, and just around how to improve what worked, what didn't, what was more effective. So there's that constant iteration that needs to happen. Having participated in the Treasury roundtables and, and the uh, in-person consultation, I think that's a great example. I think where Treasury is to be applauded for engaging with the community that way. My only ask is we would always like more time to go deeper with these things. And I think oftentimes, um, you know, Treasury might have it as a you know, an announced policy response where there's a short period of time, the longer time that mm. all participants can contribute is, is always helpful. But I think it's been refreshing to see Treasury's approach to that consultation. And, and data is a very sensitive issue at the moment, but um, nothing would help us more than um, uh, better access to better coordinated data. Um, and there's, there's a lot that we, that we need to do experimental work on, but there's so many questions that could be answered with um, good harmonised data sets both from the administrative side and from the industry side. So platforms that allow us, you know, MADIP has been a step in the right direction, but there's scope for a lot more access to data that could answer these questions, not just in the testing area, but, you know, in fundamental data analysis, which we lack. Um, and, I, you know, I've been to several forums about retirement over the last year, and, um, and there are, the questions are common, and the questions have been around for a long time. One of the reasons that we don't have better answers is because we don't have better access to data. Existing data as well as additional new survey data, perhaps? Both, yeah. Broadening the yeah. base. Yeah, there's, there's data there. 
Yeah, okay, what's the theme of data, a CPAC? I guess information <laughs> that's lacking. There was actually a theme of a CPAC Karma <laughs> conference a workshop uh, several years ago, and there was consensus in the room that yes, we definitely need more access to data. Yeah. Um, yeah so I, I think I mean we've, we're moving in that direction, but I mean if we really want to see acceleration in answers to questions, we we really need to make data available to for research. Yeah. Yep, yeah, I agree with that, um, and I think. That even goes so far as to de-identified government data mm -hmm. that can enable you to think about your retirement product offerings and strategies. Yeah, and we, we've talked all day about the um, complex interface between uh, retirement, uh, uh, accumulation, decumulation, aged care, um, and and the, the the personal and social aspects of retirement. Um, if if we can if we can draw together data that crosses the the different government departments and the different um, uh, uh, private sector organisations that are manage, helping to manage people work, people's wealth, we can get closer to answering some of those questions. But at the moment, most of that is either quite separate or it's um, it's or unavailable. Yeah. Okay, we have a question over here. If I could just return briefly to the uh, minimum drawdown issue. Um, in the early stages of COVID, where everybody was so frightened and the economy was falling apart, um, uh, I mentioned that um, uh, the then Treasurer Josh Frydenberg implemented was the minimum drawdown you know, could um, be reduced to half of what is in the schedule. And I just wonder whether um, that is um, a reflection of how entrenched and committed um, our culture is, you know, to um, maintaining that capital, you know, for the future, um, just in case you know, need very expensive residential care in the fragile years at the end of your mm -hmm. life, and uh, whether that policy was completely um, mistaken, or um, whether you had any comments about the timeliness of that implementation then. Um, so I will, I will just say it, it happened during the GFC as well, um, where minimum drawdown rates were um, reduced, and it was again it was a reflection on there was so much volatility in financial markets, and as a consequence, not wanting to force people to divest at the loss in the market, um, and so it gave. But again, it's a minimum drawdown. It's not a mandatory drawdown amount, but it gave people flexibility so that they weren't having to divest their assets at a period of such extreme financial volatility. So that's the policy behind it. Um, different people, you know, have different. We've talked about the complexity of decision making. Different responses to it. I think also from from an equity and society perspective, I think if you were to abolish a minimum drawdown. You would be amazed how much of a mass wealth community will try and gamify getting the age pension in some way, shape or form, when potentially they really don't need it. So I think you'd be cautioning against you know, removing that altogether. Yes, Ben? No, I just got a comment again on the, the trust issues. This is something I was discussing with Len and Frank about the the kind of asymmetry in um, the trust relationship between the provider and the pension and the person and access to the money. So when I'm saving and my provider is saying it's a good idea if you put more money into a pension, the cynic might say, well, get yeah, more money because you can manage it and it's going into your fund. Whereas when I'm retiring and I'm being told, spend more of it, spend more of it, you need to spend more of it. But that that kind of message is, it, it, if I think there's some catch involved in it, or I think that there's a, why are you telling me to spend my money? If it's a purely altruistic, no, I really want you to spend it because your life's going to be better if you spend it. Well, how do we get that, that message across without people sort of saying, well, it's none of your business to tell me how fast I spend my money? At least in accumulation, I can get the point that the more I have, the better it's going to be. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting one. I think it might go to the psyche of most accumulators see super as a tax, but actually, you know, as a product provider, our, our promise is we give you it back and more when you want it. 
that actually I, I think it's not really framed at that. When it comes to pension time, they've forgotten why they were putting money into the system in the first place. Um, that that was the reason, and, and so I think it is reframing it. You know, this this is the the end of your accumulation journey, and this is what you've been working towards. Now is the time to make the most of it. So I don't know if that helps. My sense is it's, it's the reframing of when the money is going into the system. It's well, I can't do anything about it. So, but I don't think they quite equated the fact that it's for something. At the end. And, and my part of my point that I made briefly was that messaging, that narrative has to start much earlier than it traditionally hasn't. So, because people are used to the notion that you put, you accumulate it, they're not used to the notion that you run it down. Mm -hmm. And if, if you suddenly got to adjust to that at that point, rather than, I oh, know I've been thinking about how much I'm going to need and knowing how long it will last mm -hmm. for yeah. a much longer part of the journey. Suzanne um, mentioned in the break around, I was just asking her about the University of California and their experience around annuities. And she'd mentioned that having that conversation when someone's 30 or 40 years old is way more effective than having it on retirement because the way they engage with the system, the way they think and then their expectations change dramatically versus trying to, to engage someone at 60 who already has mm. quite set expectations. That's so why I, I thought your study around um, anchoring to income versus mm -hmm. balances, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, we've run out of questions and I've, oh no, actually, Mike. Well, I have a geeky question, I guess it's for <laughs> maybe Susan and Hazel. Um, there's a strong presumption here that the rate of accumulation is too slow. Yeah. Suboptimal. Right? Now, um, if I wanted to fit the data, I'm guessing I could get it as slow as I want just by making people care enough about the quest. Yeah. And also by making consumption and leisure strong enough substitutes. Yeah. And I can get a drop in consumption when people retire. Yeah. So what, it, what is the actual data pattern that you can't fit using the standard model that, that leads you to think it is suboptimal? It's, um, uh, I didn't necessarily say that it was suboptimal. I said it was slow. The observation that, that motivates this is often that it um, has been that people die with their wealth entirely intact. Now that could be explained by their quest motive, but it's hard to explain in a life cycle model. And they'd accumulate much uh, that there, there's no connection between decumulation and mortality rates. So in a rational model, you would also expect some connection between drawdown and mortality, and you don't see that either. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so no, I wouldn't go so far as to say it was suboptimal, but what we do observe is things that are very hard to explain in a rational model, unless you've got quite extreme bequest motives. So in a life cycle model, wanting to pass away with all your wealth intact is a pretty high bequest motive, or your financial wealth intact, yeah. and your house probably. And, the, and you're people. saying that the correlation with mortality risk doesn't go the way you'd expect. Yeah, the correlation doesn't go the way you'd expect. Okay. Yeah, so they're, they're two factors. But but the other, I mean, the real, the, I think I think what, what um, the real motivation that, that we have is the empirical observation that people find um, uh, exponential problems difficult and amortisation falls into that category. So nonlinear non problem solving is difficult both in the accumulation phase and we expect it in the decumulation phase. And, I, and while, I mean, ours is not a comprehensive test of anything, but, it's, um, but it does indicate that if you give um, anchors to people um, and guidance around that, they tend to use them. I suppose there's a different way you could look at it, where it's, yeah. if, if somehow by giving them, if somehow by making them understand the problem better, you can get them to accumulate quicker. Yeah. So I, this, I guess this, that would prove ex post that they had been accumulating so yeah. often and slow. Yeah. In the same way that we. We observed that projections encouraged people to make higher voluntary contributions, which is clearly um, what Ben would describe as a boost, not a nudge. So all you're doing is giving people reframed information and then allowing them to make a decision for themselves. 
um, that's that's the genre that we're testing, if you like. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, unless there's a final comment from any of the panelists, in fact, please, if anyone wants to make a final observation, please do so before I turn the microphone over to Mark somewhere out there. No. Okay. But, I mean. For mine, I'd be just very keen for um, every Superfund member to be treated like a defined benefit plan to <laughs> treat its membership. Yeah, you know, I take you through your cash flow modeling. What is your future liability? Yeah. What are your assets today? What do you need? I think if you could get that in a comprehensive way, yeah. you know, you could communicate that quite easily to most people. Most people can't tell you how they spend their money today, yes. let alone how they're going to spend it in 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. The older I get, the more I want a real life annuity. <laughs> You probably need a few more providers in this market. <laughs> Thank you for being thanking the panel for an excellent session. And now somehow the marvels of technology will beam in Mark DeCure, who I'll introduce as soon as I know him there. Uh, Mark is chair of the CPAR advisory board and adjunct professor in CPAR at UNSW Business School. He played a key role in establishing CPAR and provides critical input to the development of the centre's ongoing strategy, research translation and engagement activities. And he's, he has chaired both the advisory board and the leaders forum since inception. And he's a great asset to CPAR. Uh, over to you, Mark. For a few Thank you. Comments. Thank you, Warwick, uh, for your kind comments, and I'll be I'll be succinct. But I think this is it's important um, to me. This has been a very stimulating and high quality day. A lot to absorb and a lot to think about. And I'm reminded that I'm in already in cognitive decline, so obviously it's gonna take me some time. Look, this whole process is really important to the CPAR model. You know, one thing that drives me is to ensure that the research is, is informed by the questions that people that want to use it want answered, but also to make sure that whatever research is done is actually shared and shared quickly and not hidden under a bushel. And I think days like today are really important for that process. But just as important is the reflection afterwards about what, what were the, the unanswered questions? What, what don't we know? What can we do better? Just quickly on today, I'll do a quick sum up, but not much, you're all there. But I, I thought Raf's opening session was a great reminder of and summary of CPAR's extensive high quality research that's often multi in an area where multidisciplinarity is vital. Um, you know, and, and his research proof brief will hopefully inform future research, product and service solutions, and also policy decisions. And we've found this with a number of our um, research briefs in the past. You know, they've been referred to as go-to documents for people that work in the area. And hopefully this is going to be another go-to document, Raf. And, and, and thank you for that. And uh, thank for everyone that contributed to it. In terms of takeaways from today, I mean, it's, it's really been, I mean, some of the old chestnuts have come out, but today was very much about, you know, the system we have and I guess cognition and the intersection of the two. And one thing that's not new to any of us in the room is Australia and globally, we've outsourced funding and, in, you know, basically, you know, the, the, the funding and responsibility for complex decision-making in retirement to individuals. And yet we've outsourced that to individuals who really don't have the skills. And we've done it in an environment that's highly complex. Um, it's uncertain. Um, and we couple that up with uh, reducing cognition. So we, we really, we, we've really got the Olympics here. We've, we've set a high bar for people to jump over, whichever way you look at it. Um, we have inconsistent rules between, and structures between super deaccumulation, age pension, health and aged care, and NDIS care. Um, and in short, I really question whether we're asking too much of individuals. And we have to have a really good hard look at simplifying the system. Because until we do that, you know, no, no genius can, can solve it, including many of the geniuses in the room. I think one of the other big takeaways from today is really that cognitive decline is real, albeit variable. We, we shouldn't assume everyone suffers from it. We shouldn't shoehorn everyone into that. And as Ian Yates made the point, even people in cognitive decline actually have cognition that's capable of making decisions about themselves for quite some time. And we shouldn't disenfranchise them too early. And I think often we do. Um, I think, 
the other thing is that decreasing cognition is is drawn by all sorts of factors. But, sorry, the decision making is drawn by other factors rather than cognition and socioeconomic, race, personality, relationships, networks. There's lots of things we need to think about when we're thinking about how people make decisions. And we shouldn't just think about, you know, the economically rational one. I think to me, there's still a big question about um, what are the, you know, about making the correct choices, about nudges and defaults, and the role and a need for advice. Um, for instance, if we had a simpler system, we wouldn't need so much advice. We may still need it. Um, and I think there was a point made by many people today which really is important, and that's about the need to consider the individual's needs and preference, not just the economically rational best choice as defined by somebody. Um, we should have, uh, you know, solutions that help we should have sort of, I think, some solutions that help solve the complex and ambiguous issues like longevity and morbidity, but also have choice for the more concrete things like people's preferences and their means. Um, a sort of mass customised solution, I think, and technology should enable that. Anyway, hopefully today we are clearer on what we don't know, we're clearer on the issues, and hopefully we've question some of our previous biases and preconceptions. And um, if we've done that, that's great. Very quickly, the research proof is available online. You'll receive a link if you attended today. Um, and also please feedback thoughts. Um, I now quickly turn to thank yous. It's very important that in day, days like today don't just happen. You know, there's a lot of people that got it here you know, Raf and Sophie Yan for the research brief, but also all the research behind that, whether it's Karen or Hazel, you know, Susan, every, all the 40 people that have contributed a lot of knowledge that actually get summarised by Raf in such an excellent way. Thank you to all of them. And thank you to the organisers and the presenters and the attendees. It's, this is no useful if, you know, people don't turn up. It's not useful if people don't present. And it's not useful, it's not thought provoking. And it was all of those things. So thank you to everybody. It's been great. Um, I certainly got pages and pages of notes I'll have to, you know, think through. And, and thanks to the sponsors, which obviously CPAR and also Warwick, uh, and also Karma. Sorry, Warwick. <laughs> I know you're different. Um, and all the YV team and, and, and you know, Silky and, and all the people behind here that, that made the day possible. The slides and recordings will be available um, and they'll be uploaded on the CPAR website in due course and you'll all be notified when that happens. And, um, you know, hopefully people refer to them because there's a lot here and, you know, you need to be a genius to have absorbed it all. Uh, what's coming up? There's a few things coming up. Um, there's a Mature Workers in Organisations virtual symposium coming up on uh, the 12th of October. There's the second workshop on understanding overcoming confusion in consumer financial decision making, a lead on from today on the 13th. Um, uh, there's an, an IPRA and CPAR webinar, which I think Susan Thorpe's involved with on motivated savings. We've got the uh, 30th colloquium on pensions and retirement coming up in uh, what late November, early December. And that's been going for 30 years and it's a, it's a must, must, must attend event in my view. And next year, on, in the middle of the next year, we've got the CPAR International Conference, which we tend to have towards the end of, we have one towards the end of the first CPAR and we'll have another one now and it's works going to planning for that now. So please, um, please be aware of that. Um, I think the other thing that's just the final thing I'll say is that, you know, all good things have to come to an end. And, you know, sadly, um, that conference next year will be one of the last things for CPAR. And, um, you know, CPAR will still go for another 18 odd, 18 odd months, maybe, but it is coming to the end. We're very focused on making sure what it does is absorbed into policy or a new research centre or maybe within general, in faculties overall or within departments, or maybe all the answers have been provided. But I don't think so. I think there'll be a lot more needs doing and we just need to be aware of that and um, be supportive of the structures that follow. But, um, but with that, I'll say thank you and hope everyone enjoyed the day as much as I did and Warwick, back to you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I just wanted to add thanks to what Mark has just said. 
Um, the technical support has been outstanding. Thank you everyone for getting yeah. the computers and the technology to work. I'd particularly like to thank Silke from CPAR Maine as well as Hong Yu who have done a great job making this all come together. Hong has joined Karma in the last few months. She picked up the ball from Rosanna Bustos Pinto and has been a fantastic contribution both to CPAR and to Karma and we really appreciate your contribution. And again, thanks again to the speakers, participants. Um, I learned a lot because I didn't know very much about this topic when I started the day, so I really appreciate adding human capital whenever I can. Thank you all and safe travels.